Cool. All right, so let's just get right into this. I know that usually the, the speaker that has the, uh, the talk, you know, right after lunch has to deal with the food coma thing, so I'm going to have a lot of pictures, a lot of stuff that you don't have to really focus too much on, not too many words, hopefully, and we'll get through this fast. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I am a native Torontonian from, originally from Etobicoke. It's uh, always good to come back home. Um, this is my first uh, entry into the gaming drug. It's Atari 2600. Um, lots of broken controllers if you guys have played with this way, way back in the day. Um, I went to Waterloo. Um, anybody went to, going to Waterloo right now? That's cool. That's awesome. I know we have a, a speaker, I think, tomorrow. Uh, from Waterloo, um, that'll be that'll be talking. It'll be awesome. And then I went to Waterloo actually to do this kind of stuff. To, I studied applied physics because I wanted to make rockets and I wanted to go to space and I wanted to work on the space shuttle. But then very quickly I realized there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of math, too much math. All right, sorry. Um, but that didn't deter me. You know, I said. Okay, I can still do something cool with, uh, with, with my life. And uh, I moved to Seattle, joined this company, Microsoft, where Heather mentioned, you know, we, we've crossed paths before. And I've been really fortunate in my career to work on a lot of cool products and experiences and games. I've kind of worn every hat from a game designer to, you know, a, managing a studio and um, everything from, uh, you know, cool products like the 360 and stuff to, not cool at the time, products like Zune, but have become cool because Guardians of the Galaxy 2 made it cool again. It's awesome. So, um, and now I work at Riot. Um, actually, I don't work in the main office. I actually work in the Bay Area with a small little R&D facility where I'm um, an experienced design lead. Um, so, with that, I also, you'll see a lot of references to Legos today, and you'll also see references to these guys. I don't know if this is before the time of some people here, but this is like way back. You guys know who these guys are, right? Like, yeah, okay, good, all right. Um, but I feel like they've influenced um, my thinking about how uh, game platforms are built um, and the rules and the, uh, uh, the guidelines that go into designing game platforms. So we'll, we'll see these guys later on. Um, let's go ahead. So we've got, um, these are the things we'll talk about today. So we'll just kind of take a quick look at what exists today. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about kind of the core elements that go into game platforms. Hopefully touch on a bit of some of the gotchas, at least for what is emerging right now in 2017, and we'll talk a little about the future and wrap it up. Hopefully this will be fast, we'll plow through this. I know we don't uh, uh, have a ton of time, but um, lots of pictures, like I said, so enjoy, sit back. Um, before we get into the state of the, you know, of, you know, the platforms today, I think it's always good to go back. Um, I'm relying on my good physics buddies here, Mr. Einstein and Hawking, to, to tee it up. And 1979 is kind of uh, is an important moment. This is the, the culture back kind of when I was growing up. Um, how many people actually grew up in this culture like this? Okay. Well, it's not, not too bad. I don't feel that old. Um, it's pretty good. But why was 79 interesting? Well, that was when CompuServe came out, I don't know if any of you guys use CompuServe, but I mean, this was kind of one of the first popular examples of you know, a persistent online community where there was content that was being ingested by lots of different providers, lots of different um, services. Um, there was a social communication hub, um, there was messaging, there was all the kind of cool stuff that we sort of take for granted with the, with the internet today was, this was one of the first places where it kind of got put together into one uh, designed experience, you know, and then even something like subscription model, you know, the idea of paying like a monthly fee for uh, access was something that was, was made popular with, with CompuServe. Um, 93, uh, it's almost like this picture was designed for this slide, right? It's pretty awesome, right? Um, but no, Mulder and Scully didn't help me with that, but 93 was browsers, okay, and basically this is the internet, you know, as what we know today, and and you know, we don't have to elaborate, this is not a talk about browser, browser and internet, but a lot of the enabling technologies and presentation um, systems and, and everything from CMS and ingestion, uh, content ingestion systems all kind of started because of uh, this product. Um, 95, this awesome movie, Usual Suspects, yeah, it's a cool thing. Anybody want to guess what happened in 95 that might have been influencing platforms at all, game platforms, anybody? No, okay. Um, PlayStation came out. Now, PlayStation had a lot of cool things about it, you know, 3D graphics, all this stuff, but the one thing that I think was interesting about the PlayStation was that it had this in it, okay? It had a CD player 
built into the system. So there was something you could actually do beyond playing games. It started the first path, the path forward of making the platform be a destination into itself. And it actually set basically, um, you know, for three generations of consoles that Sony did, you had uh, the console being kind of like the cheapest gateway into a new form of media, right? So PS2, that was the cheapest DVD player, right? And PS3 was the cheapest Blu-ray player, right? So uh, interesting that, that this was kind of a tipping point in terms of, hey, now the console, when you turn it on, if you didn't put a cartridge in or a disc in, at least it's, it did something kind of useful. Uh, 98, awesome, Mr. Freeman here smashing something and guts and stuff flying up. Uh, 98 was Dreamcast. Anybody have a Dreamcast? All right, cool. Anybody still play their Dreamcast? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wish this console had more success than it did, but um, it did a lot of really cool things, um, again, in terms of not only the games that, that, that came uh, to be brought to the, to the players, but from some of the technologies that came, uh, that were part of it, that were really interesting, like the broadband adapter, right? There was actually a dial-up adapter and a broadband adapter that, something you could plug into to this, which was really cool. And yeah, you got a disk which had a web browser, <laughs> if you can believe. Now trying to type and trying to enter URLs with that controller, not so great uh, of an experience, but that was cool. Um, again, having some functionality in, in, in the console that was more than playing games was pretty awesome. Uh, let's go up to 2005. Um, gorillas, love Gorillas. I think they're still going strong. It's kind of weird to think that the members of Gorillas, at least the, the two guys who were in the Clash, um, have been longer in Gorillas than they were in the Clash. Like they've been, that's how long Gorillas have been around, so it's, it's pretty wild. But the big thing in 2005 is 360, and this is, uh, not to put too much bias. I spent a lot of time in this, so but I think we did a lot of cool things here that maybe pulled to get together a lot of the pioneering work that other platforms um, uh, revealed over the years. But things like the storage, you know, having a big fat hard drive where you could download a bunch of stuff was really cool. Um, the updating uh, dashboards, you know, the, the thing that where the, the, the dash would be constantly updating with new content. We actually reflashed the, the dashboard. Uh, and changed it, you know, the whole UX uh, several times. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, again, carrying on that the, plat the platform can be more than just about playing games. This was the first uh, existence of Netflix outside of the web browser on some consumer electronics device. If you remember, it didn't look like this; it looked like something else. But that was uh, kind of cool at the time. But um, uh, and now it's kind of you take it for granted that every pretty much every device is going to have an app that runs runs Netflix. Um, and this idea of you know, some meta experience or meta progression that the system kind of manages and you can, you can track your progress across uh, multiple games, you can share it out. Um, you know, I think everybody's had, if you've had a 360, you, know, you close your eyes and you can still hear that sound, that bloop, you know, that <laughs> the achievement unlock thing uh, coming up, so definitely uh, uh, very cool. Um, so now, okay, let's talk about what exists today. Um, so I think when you look at the, the kind of platforms that exist, a lot, that exist today, there's lots of ways to think about um, uh, what they're for, like why they exist or who's creating them. So I'm just going to go through some ways to categorize some of the contemporary platforms today. And this is not comprehensive by any means, but it kind of gives you an idea of what, what exists. So we've got publisher-specific portals that, you know, like Battle.net, Uplay, Origin, et cetera, or even TGP. I don't know if you guys have gone to China and seen the, the Tencent gaming platform. It's pretty, pretty amazing what they've put in there. But this is basically uh, a set of uh, experiences that are all about, um, that revolve around a single publisher pushing out their games. It usually has some kind of utility in there for like updating uh, the games, patching, release notes. Uh, and uh, when you have a new game, then this is kind of the way it gets, gets exposed. Usually some social features as well too. Messaging and chat are taken care of um, by the publisher portals. Um, then you've got the console-centric ones, which we've already talked about before, but you know, these are the big three. Then you might not think of this as being a platform, but there's quite a few experiences that are super utility-centric or hardware-centric. So some things like the GeForce experience or even Razer Cortex, they amp on 
um, not only getting the most out of the hardware, or specifically for your PC, you know, in terms of graphics card settings and so forth, but then also a lot of cool stuff with like enabling streaming, you know, or capturing uh, uh, content that, again, you could share out with your friends. Uh, some interesting social um, uh, integrations as well that, that come out of this. Um, let's keep going. Then there's, oh, um, Emily, are you around? Yeah, hi, Emily. So Emily, the CEO of Congregate, I did not put this in because she was here, but I say, hey, it's <laughs> awesome. Um, but uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's related to like free to play and you know, more social oriented kind of platforms. Um, RetroPie, anybody guys do any kind of MAME stuff or like retro gaming kind of things? Like there's actually a ton of interesting stuff that um, in terms of you know, the, the design of, of, of what you see and how you launch and, and, uh, and the utility side of things that come out of homebrew and DIY stuff. That's stuff that is like every day you discover new things and people come up with new skins to kind of change the experience so that it feels like something that existed you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, right? Um, very, very cool. Um, and then you've got things like storefronts, Steam, we're totally like, you know, everyone, everyone's on PC, this is, this is uh, huge. Interestingly, storefronts, um, the storefront side of Steam, and Steam started in 2003, and it was more of a tool, I think, to update um, Counter-Strike, I think is what it was, I think it was, was Counter-Strike. Um, but in 2005, which is the same time that 360 launched, they actually released two non-Valve developed games came out uh, on that platform. So it's almost like the Xbox Live marketplace for the digital downloads and then the PC stuff that Valve kind of um, kicked off started just about at the same time. So I want to give them props though because they, they, they were right there at the beginning too. Um, and then there's this new category that I think is interesting where you've got these portals and platforms which are really centered around an IP or brand, you know, and League uh, is, is one of these things um, as well as uh, recently, I think it was just last week that Disney announced um, kind of like an all-in-one app where they put everything, whether it's a game, a video, uh, social, you name it, it's all aggregated into one thing. So it's become now more of a hub of kind of, I think it's not quite the same as a publisher portal. It's much more than that. It's basically saying I want to be bought into the Disney lifestyle or maybe a Marvel lifestyle or a Lego lifestyle that um, these platforms exist. So, but all these things are really about trying to get uh, serve a lot of different masters, whether it's the player, whether it's the, pl uh, the platform creator, whether it's the people providing the content, they're really trying to figure out one structure that appeases everybody, that can somehow have everything fit nicely into one experience, and um, you know, hopefully doesn't step on each other's toes, you know, especially when you start adding new things or uh, the, the size of the, the, the world grows. So that's kind of like what the theme of the talk today is really to think about all these things that go into platform design and seeing how these, these players can try to make it work into, into one cohesive experience. So let's talk about a bit of the sort of the core elements of platform UX. Um, again, Mr. Lego, uh, I love Legos, but I love thinking about Legos as the building you know, obviously building bricks, because they are bricks, of, of how do you put together uh, uh, a system. And so I think at the core, you've got content and services. So whether it's game stuff, whether it's um, video now, it could even be things like meta um, uh, achievements are all sort of this content that sur is surfaced in, in typical platforms. And then you've got a bunch of services that tie them all together um, in terms of helping you find the content, navigate to it, and so forth. So um, things like... Uh, obviously settings for whatever platform you're on would be managed by the, plat uh, by the platform as well too. Billing is a huge one too that a lot of platforms take care, take care of that for, for the content providers. Uh, social connections, so things like Twitch integration or how do I capture the screenshot to post to my Facebook, a lot of platforms are taking care of that now as part of their, uh, um, the core services they offer. Um, and then a bunch of util utilitarian things are still part of platforms today, you know, whether it's matchmaking, uh, matchmaking connections, even input of text and trying to deal with, deal with the input, different input modalities, whether you're going from on-screen keyboards with a D-pad to being able to trap keyboard mouse, um, auto-updating, patching, networking, all this stuff is part of uh, a lot of platforms today. And so what you do is you get all this content and then you've got a construct that I just call aggregators. So typically you've got, you know, something like a game, or I want a bunch of games from blah, or I want to see a list of friends, but you've usually got places within 
the IA or the structure of your platform that tend to aggregate similar kinds of content. So you'll have a bunch of views set up to optimize presenting content that, are, that is similar. So I just call them aggregators. Uh, then you've got landings. You've got places where, okay, I figured out there's one thing that I want or a theme. And so this is a thing that's going to sort of consolidate all the different uh, things that are related to that one particular theme into um, kind of a destination or a hub that you can then go to launch the game or connect with the social or um, find out the latest DLC, whatnot. But usually there's some kind of, call them a landing, where you, you get kind of like an aggregation of just the one piece of, uh, one topic. And then hubs, which you could say they're kind of an aggregator, but this is usually best represented by like the home of your system. And this is, if anybody here has designed like the home, like a home page or a landing page, it's like the most contentious piece of real estate ever because everybody feels like they belong in this space. So you need to have strong guidelines and rules and justification of why every pixel is where it is and why something is ahead of something else and how stuff gets rotated out. But, um, but when you, you know, I think also too is beyond those kind of core elements. First of all, anyone seen this chart before too? Does anyone just look familiar too? It's pretty cool. It's, it's a, uh, I can't even read it too. It's like really, well, it's really small, but I'll, there's a link for it in the, in the, the presentation if you guys want to go take a look at it. It's really cool, but Digital Telepathy created this and this is, a, I actually pulled this from the Envision blog um, and it's basically a, a periodic table of design elements, which is kind of cool and it's, you know, it's talking about all the things that affect design, you know, whether it's, uh, visuals or is it aesthetic aesthetics? Is it, you know, something about like the qualities, like really high level qualities of, of the design? And so I thought, well, could I come up with like a brief set of things that might plug into here that are specific for, for, for game platforms? So I came up with four. The first two are really super important, I think. One is this idea of extensibility. I think the best platforms that you see out there are, have a way to basically grow over time and come up with ways where new features can get plugged into easily. You know, I think 360, this is an example of, when we first launched, we had it at the top there, um, where we just only had four blades, if you guys remember the old blades UI. And then, interestingly enough, there was no, there was a marketplace. We didn't add the marketplace until um, a year later, but we always kept that in our back pocket that if we needed to expand the system to have some big kind of destination landing, we could grow one more blade. But funny story is that we thought in the first year, of 360, you might have 100 to 200 pieces of content total in the marketplace, because we didn't know how big digital downloads were gonna be. And literally in the first like two weeks, we blew that up. So the whole, the aggregators and those list views and all those kinds of things were just like not working after even the first year. I think EA, anybody from EA here? Not even one, really? No. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna diss you guys or anything like that at all, but EA, EA is, um, they basically really pushed what could be done with, you know, in, think, in terms of thinking about digital downloads and what, um, what you'd want to offer. And they had like literally hundreds of pieces of content in terms of gamer pictures and backgrounds and skins and stuff, almost ready from day one. So really on day one, they already stressed our system. And, and um, I think two weeks after we launched, we were already thinking about, well, how are we going to add this fifth blade in? Because it's, it's become huge, right? And other things that are related to that, things like the Xbox Live Arcade kind of came off of that too. And again, more stuff with, with digital downloads was, was huge. So yeah, let's go through. So we, this was kind of like the, the classic kind of Blades UI. Then we did another update to go to this, the NXE UI. And then we did yet another one to go to something that was more Metro or modern Microsoft style. And then yet again to go do something that was more connect friendly, if you guys remember, with the gestures and the voice stuff. And I think this is something that I, I feel like, you know, we had a place for extensibility, uh, how to solve extensibility with Microsoft, but it really was not, um, by the time we got here, I think people were lost. They were confused. It was just like saying, like, I don't, I don't know where stuff is anymore, right? I don't know where, you know, where to find things. Things got shuffled, shuffled around a little too much. Maybe after one or two revs, if you slightly tweak it, that's okay. But I think just saying that you can just reset the whole world and expect that people are gonna find, find stuff again is kind of a fallacy. And I think we learned this uh, the hard way um, by the time we got to this iteration of the dashboard. Um, these guys, again, you remember? I thought it was gonna come back. So this idea of being scalable. So uh, if you guys remember, you know, with, with the Roadrunner and Coyote, there's, it's pretty formulaic, right, about how the cartoons always, uh, always played out. 
Um, have you guys seen this list? I've used this before in some other presentations, but this is Chuck Jones's kind of list of the, the principles of how Roadrunner and Coyote, uh, all the cartoons would work. And I think it's really cool to say like, okay, there's these nine rules that basically every episode uh, of Roadrunner and Coyote was pretty much governed by this. And I, I use this as a lot as, as inspirational for when I think about platforms and designing them, is you wanna come up with kind of a set of rules, a, a, a concise set of rules that will work for any new stuff that is unforeseen that comes into your platform, um, because you don't want to keep adding or reinventing rules or changing things out at a time. I don't think they changed any of these rules um, when when, um, when Chuck Jones is making all the cartoons. And the place places where they where they did, I think there was a time when the coyote actually talked. I think in, in, a, in a thing, it just it was not a Roadrunner uh, and Wiley Coyote cartoon anymore at that point. So. Uh, I think you, you find this in science fiction too, is like you can push things you know, pretty far in terms of telling a story and what the universe is gonna be like, but at some point, it's, uh, um, it's just, it's just um, gonna break people's uh, idea of kind of where things are or what the world is supposed to be about. No. Just keep moving ahead here, I'm gonna go a little faster. Lego, best example I think of scalable, uh, a scalable design. This guy didn't come out until 78, yet today you got something like this. That's pretty awesome. Um, Easable. So easable is all about, I, it's a terrible word, but I couldn't think of anything else, but I think it's like, what's the platform gonna do in terms of like uh, heavy lifting? Whether you're the publisher, whether you're the content provider, whether or not, or whether you're the uh, um, uh, developer, what's it gonna do for you? Um, there's um, sociable, you know, I think all the platforms today need to have some kind of element of how's it gonna connect to your community? How do you, it's a two-way conversation now, a lot of times, I think, uh, the, the Warframe guys we were talking about that earlier about this this kind of constant loop with the players is being super is super important and having a pl platform being able to under, understand how that relationship works is really important. So you put it all together and um, hopefully you don't get something that's as evil as that, but maybe you get something that magically all fits together and that's that's fantastic, right? And then you you, you get the, the cool platform. So let's move a little faster here. So, but what about traps, right? Like, what are things that you cannot see and foresee that might destroy your beautiful game platform, right? It may not be corgis that are flying in space that are gonna destroy your Death Star, but there are some things that you should keep an eye, uh, an eye for. So, one is the idea of metadata, okay? Like, looking at this, so this is No Man's Sky, but it's, when you see it in all these slides here, how it's represented, is very different, and a lot of that is sure layout, but a lot of it is the quality of the, the metadata that's being presented. And you know, I think platforms that uh, take care, uh, really care about this stuff are going to have armies of people coming up with the right metadata content to fit the spaces that are showing up in your platform. Um, Netflix is a great example of this. If you, if you guys you know, if you look at it on different tuners and different experiences, they, it looks it looks different. Still feels like Netflix, but they create their own content to populate their, uh, their space. Um, partner branding is another one that's uh, um, super, uh, super important. Like Madden, everyone knows what Madden is, but how many things have to go through, like approvals and stuff that you have to consider when the UI related to brands and marks? There's Sony, there's PS4, there's the store, there's EA, there's EA Sports, and then you've got finally the game showing up. And Mr. Brady also too, probably showing up there wanting his, his his, uh, his comeuppance. And then finally, you know, the, the idea of like these seams and the interaction between going from usually like system UI to game UI, there's a lot of times where that doesn't feel smooth. There's a lot of hitches in, in the UI and you see it a lot in things like overlays. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, and then uh, we'll talk just briefly on the regional gotchas. I think this is not a surprise, but designing your UI or the experiences so that, uh, that they're not taking into account regional specific kind of uh, expectations is, is, uh, is important. Um, the idea of like the, the kanji text that's uh, rotated 90 degrees was actually very off-putting for um, the Japanese market. Just, they just, it just didn't happen. Uh, truncation issues, that, that was another thing that's weird. Um, this is League, this is, our, this is our client here. And in China though, it looks like this. Well, it's changed now. It's a little bit. It's 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 gone to a different uh, um, uh, experience that looks a little bit more like the other one. But the density of information and what's expected. This is okay for China, but it's that if you kind of do something like this for maybe uh, Western language, it probably wouldn't work. All right. So let's wrap this up super quickly here. Um, 
the things that I think about as platforms, like in the future, like things I worry about, it's like, I'm curious to know what's gonna happen with cross-platform play in terms of the standards for how do you represent presence, how do you um, establish communications and so forth. I think this is cool, uh, I mean, like, this is a great example of the Minecraft example, like being on so many different systems and, and, and uh, what is the consistency of experience that's gonna work across all these different uh, uh, devices, I think is something that's gonna be interesting to think about in the future. VR, we're still trying to figure out, I guess, the input modalities, the structures, even, even the usability, the ergonomics and the factors of like what's comfortable, how long can people use this stuff for, this is super important in, in thinking about how platforms will evolve in the future. Um, and then games as a service, you know, I think a terrible acronym, I don't think everyone ever uses that, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the idea though that okay, you've got this thing that's constantly living and breathing and it's updating and you need to be in contact with your community and you've got to be talking with them uh, constantly to get uh, feedback and so forth. I think that's uh, interesting in terms of how do you design your platform. Like, do you design the platform in a way that's always constantly morphing and, and adjusting or you try to create that structure that's a little more rigid and you just kind of po populate content differently as, as it goes. Um, so quickly, understand the platform strategy. You know, I think it's is, is super important. Like, how does, why does it exist? Extensible, scalable, easable, sociable, I think those are core elements that I think all good game pl platforms um, do a great job with addressing and then watching out for traps. And the traps may be, there may be emergent traps too. Like I said, I gave you a little snapshot of what happened in 2017, but there could be some, some stuff that is unforeseen on the horizon. Uh, and then hopefully maybe the best you can hope for is not a one size fits all, but maybe you can do one size fits most. There could be things that you don't account for, but um, if you design the right rules and you, uh, you know, accommodated the right uh, considerations, then you can flex and you can be a good playground for most, most platforms. And then with that, thank you very much. Um.